hear your sound. Excellent. Okay, welcome, Dr. Garcia. Thank you very much, Sarah. And thank you, everyone, for inviting me to, to give this talk in a very, very important topic. I'm very glad to be with all of you. And yeah, Sarah explained, I'm going to talk to you about the One Welfare Impacts during the times of COVID-19. So firstly, I would like to explain to all of you what is One Welfare. Some of you might have heard of the concept already. Some of you know. so firstly, it's very important to understand what One Welfare is. So One Welfare is defined as the interconnection between animal welfare human well-being and their physical and social environment. And it's important to specify that it's not just the environment, but it is the physical and social environment. Because when we or animals interact with the environment, we interact with the physical things like the trees, like the farm, uh, farm equipment, uh, fences, However, we also interact with each other. We interact with different people, with different animals, with different groups of animals, and both of those elements constitute part of the environment that affects our well-being. So there is a concept, which is the One Health concept, that talks about the connection between animal health and human health. And that concept has been in place for 10 years. There is a tripartite agreement within international organizations. And the goal of this concept, when it emerged, was basically to, to try to tackle pandemics and epidemics that affect both humans and animals. So professionals that work in the human field and the, and the veterinary field can work together to help resolve these, these pandemics. However, it's not just important to look after the health, but also after the welfare. And the previous speaker already mentioned how important health and welfare are and how connected they are. So the two affect each other and health, in fact, is part of, of the welfare and our well-being. So it's very important to take a holistic approach. And for that, we should integrate the One Welfare concept to the One Health concept. So with One Welfare, we are bringing over all the well-being elements that are somewhat not as prevalent in the One Health concept. So One Welfare really is helping us to recognize those interconnections of well-being between animal, people, and the environment. And it focuses on interdisciplinary collaboration to improve the lives of humans and animals. It covers elements such as food security, sustainability, how we can reduce human suffering and improve productivity of the farming sector by focusing on, on welfare and well-being. And it really helps to enhance the One, well, the one Health concept with by bringing aspects of, of welfare and well-being, which are largely lacking in the current One Health concept most times. So the One Welfare Framework is really there to, to help to explain the breadth of the One Welfare concept. When I started speaking about this concept, many people asked me, what does One Welfare mean? And most apply it to their own areas, but it's very important to understand that the concept does not apply to one area only, but is actually holistic and applies to, to everything. So the One Welfare Framework has five sections. And what I'm going to do during this talk is use each of those sections to highlight some of the impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic. We have seen during the pandemic a lot of materials, a lot of information, a lot of infographics. And I just wanted to start with an example with zoonosis emergences, which is very relevant to the COVID-19 virus. And if you see the UN Environment Programme has published this infographic to show actually some of the effects that the zoonosis have on, on different areas, particularly focus on the environment. So the forest sec deforestation has an impact on zoonosis emergence, illegal and poorly regulated wildlife trade, intensified agriculture and livestock production, climate change and antimicrobial resistance. And what I wanted to highlight is that these examples are presented as factors that are increasing zoonosis emergence, but they are also very related to animal welfare. So when we look at deforestation, for example, there are animals that live in forest and trees are part of their habitat, they are their homes. So deforestation is affecting also welfare and well-being of animals and people that walks in those forests. So this is one example 
and it's just really to highlight that we should have welfare and well-being present when we talk about uh, zoonotic disease. It's not just about the health, but also about the welfare. So the first section of the One Welfare Framework talks about the connections between animal and human abuse and neglect. And this is basically based on a principle that has already been published and researched. And it talks about the interconnection between the maltreatment of children, the elderly, domestic violence, and animal abuse. And the one thing that all these elements have in common is that in those incidents, there is always a vulnerable sentient being, being that a child, an elderly person, an animal, or maybe a woman or a man. So the connection of the vulnerable has an impact on how abuse connects. And I'm not going to expand on the detail. This is very much linked between the, the human and the animal field. So you will have psychologists and a lot of people that is investigating this, these areas. But for those of us working with animals and with an interest in, in animals, it's important to know that those that are mistreating people are likely to have a tendency to mistreat animals as well. And it's not always a cause effect. So this is not always the case, but the, the likelihood is much higher. So it's very likely that that person might have started abusing animals, maybe to experiment, maybe to learn, maybe to, to show the frustration. And when that happens, that can evolve and increase and expand into people. So that is a pattern that has been found many times. And it is important because domestic violence is not only causing harm to a particular person or animal, but it also has a cost to society. So there is already evidence showing that victims, this is data from the U US, have cost as much as 8 million paid work days a year. So it is very important that this is looked into because it's having a, a cost to society as well, not just for the violence and the distress it causes, but also an economic impact. Um, during the pandemic, there have been many reports about increases in domestic violence in particular, and this has been actually recognized by the World Health Organization, where they, you will see in their website they have published information about the levels of domestic violence increasing across the world, including different regions as the COVID-19 pandemic escalated. And a lot of this has been done because our social environment and our physical environment has changed and many people has been confined in spaces that were not used to before with more or less space. So this has become, as they call it, the second pandemic and it's very important to pay attention to this. One of the, some of the examples I've put here is websites where have reported increases in, in helpline searches as high as 700%, which is a lot. And there have been papers that have already started to summarize the information coming across the world. And you will see here, there is a lot of text in this slide, but I've highlighted some of the, the percentages reported, such as a rises of 40 to 50% in Brazil, UK domestic violent helplines report is 25%, um, 150% increase. So you see the data varies a lot, but what is consistent is that everyone is reporting an increase. And in fact, this is not just because of COVID pandemic, but there is already evidence to show that family violence and sexual violence can escalate during and after disasters or crisis. And of course, the COVID pandemic has been a big crisis and a big disaster for the whole world. So this is really something that comes as a result of, of the situation people is placed on. And this is something that we have to have present, not during the pandemic, but also after the pandemic, as there is evidence that that can continue. I wanted to mention that the, within the organization of One Welfare, we have currently a, an ongoing project, which is looking at this particular topic. We have an advisory board, and we are working on, on basically trying to facilitate the exchange publication and dissemination of information in this area to actually try to identify best practice in the area of animal and human abuse where available the connections to the environment as well. We are aiming to cover companion animals, working animals, farm animals, and also wildlife and stray animals. And the thing is, there is quite a lot of guidance already available for companion animals, even for practitioners and veterinarians. 
but there is not so much available in the other area. So what we are trying to do is try to identify what evidence there is there and try to bring it together to help facilitate guidance that can be used and, and help professionals at global level. So the idea is to actually create these guidance that are for veterinary professionals, medical professionals, social services, and possibly the public. And the work is at initial stages, so I would like to invite all of you that have an interest in this area to reach out to explore the, pro the program in our website and to actually come forward if you would like to, to help or volunteer. There will be calls for evidence gathering, so it's something that, that maybe some of you would be interested in, in collaborating with and supporting. I will move to section two of the One Welfare Framework, which talks about the social implications of improved animal welfare. So here we have uh, one which is very familiar to everyone that works with pets, so responsible ownership. How has the COVID pandemic affected responsible ownership? When you look online in a web website search, if you, if you search for dog and COVID-19, here I found uh, this week over 3 billion results. And if you look at COVID-19, over 2, million, 2 billion results. So a lot of information has been out there specific to, to dogs and cats on COVID-19. And the thing is, if you are in confinement, if you are restricted in what you can do, that is also impacting our pets. And what we can do, can we take them to the vet? Can we take them for a walk? Can we go to buy food for them? A lot of things that, can we take them to the dog groomer? A lot of things that are normal for pet owners have been impacted and how we cope with that on top of everything else is something that has clearly affected animal welfare and also the welfare of, of owners. There have been a lot of reports about people buying animals and also impacts about um, how this affected the human dog relationships. So you will see a, a recent paper published only in November which actually talks about the human dog relationships during the COVID pandemic and the boom that there was in dog adoptions during social isolation because people was looking for the companionship. But of course, it's not just about companionship, but also about how can we care for those animals and the challenges that, that poses in individuals as well. So it can almost become a burden at times if you are not able to cope or suddenly you become sick and you are unable to, to care for this, this animal. There have been impacts as well on rescue centers and apologies, I'm just covering topics very quickly, but there is a lot behind every of the, these elements. So there is a lot of information and a lot of papers already started reporting on, on the welfare aspects that have happened. So rescue centers, interestingly, across the world have had almost opposite impact. So some reports say that the, the rescue centers became full because people just could not cope. They could not look after their animals and they were letting them go, so the rescue centers were taking them in. Some people were abandoning animals for fear that they might infect us. So there was many different reasons why people would abandon their animals that ended up in rescue centers. In other cases, people were really keen to adopt animals because they wanted companionship. So some rescue centers actually reported that they made lots of adoptions and some of them were empty and didn't have so many animals they could give away for adoption. So it's quite interesting to see the contrast and, of course, the, the reasons behind them and to study them. And also there were impacts at personal levels. So some rescue centers and welfare organizations suffer of lack of personnel, lack of funding because people was not donating so much. So all of it had a great impact on, on that sector. There was also impacts in relation to stray animals and abandoned animals. So this is a, a photograph from Brazil where the number of abandoned animals increased and actually public services such as the fire brigade we have here in the, in the photograph were helping to provide food for the animals. There were reports in some countries like Turkey where stray animals were becoming a public safety risk because they were hungry. The people that usually walk on the streets and, and feed them was not there. So the dogs were hungry and were actually chasing and becoming a public safety risk. So a lot of different impacts. So here is one from the photo I mentioned from Istanbul that actually shows how the streets were empty. So no one was actually giving food to the street dogs. And as a result, they became a danger. And of course, you see this one is 
howling and barking, so also possibly a noise nuisance for the neighbors as well that live in the area. So a lot of different impacts that are affecting people and animals in the same environment. If we move to section three of the One Welfare Framework, this section focuses mainly on farming and human well-being, that of the farmers and food security. So, I mean, the minks have been the, the farm animal that has been mentioned most often recently. And to date, six countries have already been reporting COVID-19 in farm minks. And as a result, there have been a lot of the population exercise, which Charlie will, Charles Mason will cover in the next talk. And this has created a lot of challenges, not just at welfare level, but also logistical challenge and people level and emotional level of people being really distressed because all of these animals were being depopulated from farms. So a lot, they are not just on the human, but also on the animal end. There have been reports related to, to food, the um, uh, food provision and sustainability of the food chain. And there have been reports already by FAO to talk about how the, the impacts of the livestock production chain have affected the food supplies and the farm animal supply. So as we are looking at food supply, we need to look at the food chain effects in all the stages of the, of the production chain, which go from the consumer, they then will move to the slaughter areas and then they will move to the farm areas. So we will have issues such as stocking on farms which might not be able to take their animals to slaughter. This will be affecting, of course, the welfare of animals because they will have le less space, they will be growing in an environment that usually they would not be expected to grow, and also impact on the farmers which are having to cope with this situation, having to manage suddenly these increasing animals, these increasing stocking densities, these challenges where you cannot send your animals to, to slaughter at the time that you were expecting to. And then the challenges on the slaughterhouses where there has been a lot of prevalence of COVID infections. And of course that have impacted on personnel that have impacted on the well-being of the staff and also how the slaughter operations have been carried out, impacts on transport of animals, etc. So a lot there on the food chain. And if we think of the impacts of food availability, I just want to hear the crisis, which in my view is a really interesting report, which talks about how food is connected to, to how it's also having an impact on the animals to border. And production and also to the livelihoods of people that works in livestock production and all those elements need to be unpicked and explored and treated in a holistic way so we can tackle together the, the food security issues of people but also the animal welfare issues that come through that food chain and the livelihoods. And we have also seen a lot of headlines about coronavirus and slaughterhouses so I just wanted to show here an extract from a paper that has reported and summarized what has happened in some countries. And you can see that there has been a big drop here. So this is 2021. And you can see there is a very clear pattern where the, the number of slaughter animals dropped considerably in different species. So this is for, for broilers, cattle, and pigs. And you can see that all of them suffer a big drop. And this would have had the consequent impact on food supply and also on farming of these animals. I move forward to section four, just conscious of, of the time. And section four talks about assisted interventions involving animals, human, and the environment. And this again talks about the animal human bond and also about therapy. So I will put a very simple example where we have here Arnold Schwarzenegger, and he was reported on the media uh, with his pets. Here he has two little ponies. And of course, we all not have a house as big as Arnold to be able to have a pony as a pet. So this doesn't mean that everyone should have a pony as a pet. And in fact, most shouldn't. But he's explaining that he, during the COVID pandemic, he has not been going for walks or restaurant, but he has been staying at home with his animals. And he was calling for his fans to do the same. And of course, we have to be mindful of what I was mentioning earlier, that having a pet, yes, might provide companionship, 
but it might provide also challenges and additional burdens that we might not be able to cope with. We also need to take into account what will happen when things go back to normal and we are not at home for so long and who is going to care for these animals. And also we need to be conscious of our environment in the house and what animals can we keep? Do we have the space? Do we have the resources? Do we have the facilities? So that is something very important to, to take into account. And going back to the animal therapy part, there hasn't been much reporting on assisted interventions and all the programs that were existing in terms of uh, facilitating human therapies with animals. So those clearly had been impacted by COVID-19. And I have really not been able to find much information in, in that area. So what has happened to people that was uh, undergoing treatment with animals or having support from animals and how they have coped during the COVID-19 pandemic, not just the people, but also the animals that were supporting them. We move finally to section five, which talks about the connections between biodiversity, the environment and animal welfare and human well-being. So here I have a photograph from India where you can see that there is a lot of monkeys on the street and you might have seen this on, on the media already. Um, basically areas where usually you would have people or where you would have um, tourists have been completely taken over by wild animals and by wildlife. And in this particular case, the, the article was reporting that this, these monkeys were hungry same as the stray dogs before, because the tourists that usually come to visit were not feeding them. The people that usually walks in these streets is not feeding them. And as a result, they are almost becoming rogue and they are trying to find food wherever. So there were some videos where somebody was throwing food and a mass of monkeys was coming to take them. That was generating aggression between different monkey groups that were fighting for the food and clearly big welfare problems for them as well. So not just the hunger, but also all the interactions between the different social groups of, of monkeys in this case. They're having also uh, impacts on, on biodiversity and, and the natural environment. So this is a photograph from the Caribbean, the Mexican Caribbean, where actually they started seeing animals that were at risk of an extinction. And in this particular photograph and article, they were mentioning jaguars, leatherback turtles, and crocodiles. And there have been reports of waters becoming cleaner because there hasn't been so much pollution from ships, from boats, from tourist traffic. The beaches were becoming cleaner. And there have also been reports of rivers becoming cleaner. And for example, there were reports in the Bosphorus, they were sighting dolphins because of all the changes that the COVID-19 restrictions brought together. So there have been some positives in terms of uh, biodiversity and wildlife. However, there have also been reports of negative impacts. So in some countries, there have been increased wildlife, illegal wildlife uh, catching, because there were not so many people to watch. So the looters and the people that is taking wildlife uh, illegally were actually having less, uh, less enforcement and less restrictions to actually be able to take these animals. So that has been something of concern that the absence of tourists and the, the absence of, of enforcement officers that were monitoring certain areas have led to a, a loss of biodiversity in some regions. So that is something to take into account as well and maybe to, to, to monitor and to try to evidence. I wanted to show a video to you, which I thought was really interesting about how animals have been taking the, the streets and the spaces. And that's something that I really found fascinating to see where wild animals that would not usually be in, in cities have actually been appearing and been sighted. So you see, it's really all over the world. So it's not just in Europe or in China, but it's truly global. And you can see it can also be a threat for people if you suddenly walk and find a rhino on the street that usually should be people there or monkeys take over your swimming pool. 
or Puma's your garden? So this is really a reflection for everybody that during the pandemic, there have been a lot of changes to the environment in terms of social and physical environment. The absence of people has clearly made a space for wildlife and for animals to take over those spaces. The question is what will happen when things change again and people come back? And you saw the, the image of the elephant on the, on the road where the person has to literally run away. So this is also, creating not just positives of wildlife sightings, but also negatives of increased human wildlife conflicts. And that's something that is important to monitor and to manage correctly to ensure that the welfare of those animals is preserved, but also the welfare of the people that is coming across them. I wanted to flag that, to conclude that during the pandemic, uh, we did a call for people to bring forward resources that they thought were important for people, animals and the environment. And we have shared on the website some materials that we try to, to keep generic at global level to actually try to help people to understand that the resources that are being available uh, needs to really be applicable to people, animals and the environment. And we really need to take a holistic approach when we are managing and coping with the situations we have been placed with to actually be able to, to, to go through in, in a sustainable way. I would like to conclude with two key points. In my view, we really must do everything possible to encourage collaborations of One Health and One Welfare between the different professionals and sectors to maximize societal benefits. Whilst well, in some countries the COVID-19 pandemic has been managed by medical professionals, for example, it's vital to ensure that other professionals, such as veterinarians, are also included to manage the aspects relevant to, to animals as well. And we have seen there are quite a lot of them. And the COVID-19 pandemic, it's a global challenge that must be tackled holistically recognizing the interconnections between animals, people, and the environment. So we cannot just focus on the impact of virus on people, but we really need to take into account how not just the virus, but also the control measures are affecting many different areas that go beyond people only. So the One Health and One Welfare approach is really key for this. I would like to thank you all, and I hope that uh, you have um, taken enough to understand that the One Welfare concept is really relevant within the pandemic. And I hope that the examples I've given you really helped you to, to identify more because there are many, many that I have not mentioned and really needs to be taken into account. Many thanks everybody. And I will hand over the floor to, to Sarah. Thank you.